When 411 BCE rolled around, Athens began recovering from the brutal Sicilian expedition and a year of coup-driven instability. By now, Athens and Sparta were once more in a state of open war, and with the Persian Empire now on Sparta's side, that war was about to take a new turn. For now, Athens had the advantage, but how long would they be able to hold it against the new alliance they now faced? This video will explore how Persia engaged with the Hellenic world, how Athens rebounded, and how Sparta responded. This series on the Peloponnesian War is kindly sponsored by our YouTube members and patrons, and the series has been initially released as an exclusive for our supporters. Patrons and YouTube members get two exclusive videos weekly and can currently watch the completed series on the First Punic War, Peloponnesian War, History of Prussia, Italian Unification Wars, Risorgimento, as well as dozens of other videos and the continuation of our Pacific War series. New series is on the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusades, Xenophon Anabasis, and much more are being released for our backers right now. You can join their ranks via the link in the description and pinned comment to get exclusive videos, early access to all public videos, access to our schedule, wallpapers, and a special Discord server where we're very active, and much more. Thanks for supporting us, we couldn't be doing it without your help. In a resurgent democracy, the old factional actors were at it again including Alcibiades. Seen as a traitor by many, he was eager to regain the power and favour he had once held in the city through military successes. Militarily, Athens concentrated its efforts on the Hellespont, where they were trying to assume complete control of the region and push out Spartan and Persian influence. In 410 BCE, they built their navy again and began preparing for war in those narrow straits. Meanwhile, Sparta tried to break through to allied cities like Chalcedon, but Athenian patrols destroyed these expeditions. Athens's vice over the Hellespont was secured when they entered into diplomatic negotiations with Sparta's ally, the Shahenshah of the Achaemenids, and managed to secure a deal with Pharnabazos to maintain control of Chalcedon. Things were not looking good for Sparta, but as fortune would have it, court intrigue in Persia would soon turn the tides back in their favour. Two Achaemenid princes, Arsaces, the oldest, and Cyrus, the second-born, were engaged in a battle for the throne, with the queen mother Parasatis favouring the latter. Cyrus had the odds stacked against him, for multiple other relatives and powerful satraps, including our old friend Tissaphernes, were all against him, as they all preferred Arsaces as ruler. Nevertheless, with the help of his mother, Cyrus outmaneuvered them all, then sought to secure his position by gaining a secure alliance with Sparta. It is here, in 407 BCE, where our well-acquainted Spartan Mothax Lysander entered the Aegean as a Navarch once more. Lysander had taken over from the now-dead Mindarus and was keen to assert Sparta's interests in the Aegean. Athens was doing very well in the region so a tightening of Perso-Spartan friendship was in order. Lysander and Cyrus subsequently met in Sardis, and agreed to work together against Athens in Asia Minor. This provides an intriguing insight into the geopolitics of this phase of the war. While both Sparta and Persia had a common enemy, their alliance was not guaranteed due to different schools of thought in their political arenas. Many Spartans feared that their role as protectors of Hellas would be compromised if they became dependent on Persia and had to give up influence in Ionia. We have no sources from the Persian side, but it is possible they feared Sparta replacing Athens as a rival in the region. Sparta used Persian funds to increase the pay of their rowers, and then built up 20 triremes at Ephesus, increasing its 70-strong fleet to 90. In response, Alcibiades forced Lysander's hand and took an Athenian fleet to Notium. Lysander did not take the bait, biding his time. After a while, Alcibiades left his main fleet to tour nearby Athenian garrisons, bestowing command of his ships on his second mate, Antiochos. Antiochos was given orders not to fight Lysander. However, being a typical Athenian, Antiochus ignored the orders and began a naval attack on the Spartans anyway. Here, our principal primary sources of Diodorus and Xenophon diverge in their accounting of events. Diodorus says Antiochus took ten ships straight to Ephesus, 
causing Lysander to take out his force, one-shot Keo Antiochus's ship, and then begin a chase of screaming Athenian sailors back to Notium. Xenophon says Antiochus only brought two ships to the harbour and sailed to the Spartans. Lysander only sent a few ships at first, but apparently Athens sent more ships, but the reinforcements only caused the Spartan fleet to be unleashed. In any case, the Spartans crushed Antiochus's advance force, then sailed onwards to Notium. The Athenians in Notium dashed to their ships, sailed out, and organized themselves in many small contingents to do battle. Ultimately, they were destroyed by Sparta's numerical superiority, with 15 of the 22 ships being sunk. A triumphant Lysander returned to Ephesus. Alcibiades returned in utter humiliation to Samos, where the army had retreated. In a last bid to save his reputation, Alcibiades took his entire fleet to Ephesus to offer battle. Still, Lysander remained barricaded and refused to engage, knowing he would be disadvantaged if he did so. Humiliated, the Athenians returned to Samos. This was the end of Alcibiades' political career. After the defeat of his navy, the Athenian people turned against him, and he went into self-exile in Thrace. He would unsuccessfully try to re-enter politics for the remainder of his life, until he passed away in 404 BCE. We are not sure how this happened, but Plutarch claims it happened when he went to the Persian court to gain favour for Athens against Sparta. However, his nemesis Lysander had already sent envoys to Pharnabazus to arrange for assassins to take Alcibiades out. The assassins set Alcibiades' house on fire, and Alcibiades decided to have his final stand. He rushed out of the burning structure and was killed in the ensuing knife brawl. Thus ends the story of the statesman, traitor, general, and turncoat who decided to meet his end with honor. In 406 BCE, Lysander was relieved of his post. The Navarch who succeeded him in the Admiralty, Callicratidas, continued trying to break through to the Athenian sphere of influence. This meant going around the Ionian coast to try and take some cities in that region from Athens. Callicratidas was going to face an Athenian admiral named Conon, and he tried to make sure he had a numerical advantage by rallying 140 ships to his side. The fleet began sailing across the coast and engaging in minor battles. The first was the Siege of Delphinium in 406 BCE. Delphinium was an Athenian base on Chios, an island that had been one of the first fortresses to rebel against Athens after the Syracuse debacle. Despite Athens's inability to retake Chios, they managed to begin a blockade of the island using the fortress and ensured some minimal control in the region. Outside Delphinium was a 500-strong Athenian garrison, trying to take over a hostile island who now faced an entire Peloponnesian fleet. This gulf in manpower must have become obvious to them as soon as they saw the fleet appear. So before the fight began, they raised the white flag of surrender. The Spartans let them go and join the other Athenian forces, and then they proceeded to level the fortress to the ground. Following this success, Callicratidas continued to a second Athenian stronghold at Methymne on the island of Lesbos, which had a far larger garrison. Sparta sent out waves of attackers to breach this bastion all of whom were repulsed. Nevertheless, Callicratidas eventually broke inside some of the walls, presumably the outer ones. Here we see divergences amongst the post-Thucydidean historiographical landscape. According to Diodorus Sikelos, the local Methymnians wished to stop the fighting. As such, they betrayed the city to the Spartans by letting them inside the walls. Xenophon doesn't mention any such betrayal, and merely describes an eventual victorious assault. The Peloponnesian fleet then moved on and almost intercepted the Athenian navy. Conon, the Athenian commander, took his ships and fled, though many Athenian vessels were captured. Conon was in the region to help the Methymnians, but had stayed in Hector Tenesia, to the south of Adramitium to Lesbos' east, after hearing of the city's fall. The Peloponnesians tried to cut them off from their base at Samos. At dawn, the Athenians and Spartans met at sea, and Conon fled towards Mytilene. Callicratidas chased after him and entered the harbour of the city, which was a massive gulf region. A battle ensued, and 30 ships were destroyed on the Athenian side, although the crews mostly survived. Callicratidas surrounded the city and began a long siege. 
our two historians diverge in their accounts yet again. Xenophon describes a lack of food, which caused the city to face starvation. He claims that Conon tried to send a message for help to Athens with two of his ships. One ship was captured, while the other reached the Hellespont and from there broke through to Athens. Diodorus Siculus describes things differently, claiming that Conon initiated the first battle, and that the second harbour battle was done after the siege began. Ten ships worked their way from Samos to Athens, but Callicratidus intercepted and captured them. As Athens heard of the siege in Mytilene, its citizens immediately began to raise a new fleet from across their entire empire. A multitude of ships from Athens, their Samian sidekicks, and other Aegean islands were assembled and sent forth from Samos. Thus began the epic struggle that was the 406 BCE Battle of Ayanousae. Athens sent no less than eight of their finest generals to the fight. Aristocrates, Aristogenes, Diomedon, Erecinides, Lysias, Pericles the Younger, the son of Pericles and Aspasia, Protomachus and Thrasyllus. Athens also had 70 ships under Conon in the region, and with their reinforcements had a tally of 155 ships. Sparta had 140 ships there already present. Callicratidas had grown increasingly confident, and thus took 120 ships to come along to face the Athenian combatants. The rest of the ships stayed at Mytilene. The two armies were fated to meet as the Greek goddess of dawn, Eos, set her chariot forth for the new day after a thunderstorm the Greeks could only believe Zeus himself had sent. The western shores of the Ionusi Islands were witness to the greatest naval battle of the Peloponnesian War. The Athenian fleet arranged itself into two lines. The far left flank included Aristocrates with 15 ships, while Pericles the Younger was right behind him. To their right was Diomedon with 15 ships, and Aresinides behind him. The centre included Athens's loyal Aegean allies, with Athenian taxiarchs and navarchs in command of the fleet. Further right was Protomachus with Lysias behind him, with 15 ships each. The fringe right flank included Thrasyllus, who commanded the front line, and Aristogenes the rear. The Athenian left wing was next to the open sea, while the right was towards the shore. The allies were right in the centre of the line, right in front of the Ionusae Islands. This was an ingenious strategic move, as the Spartans had to be close to not fall into the open sea, while the island at their back meant that any form of sneak attack could not surround Athens. Callicratidas responded by splitting his fleet, with him taking up the right flank and his Boeotian allies under Thrasondas the Theban taking up the left flank. The Spartan admiral was outnumbered this time, and felt Sparta was growing increasingly dependent on Persia. Thus, he decided to initiate the fight in order to gain a short-term victory that would gain the advantage without Persian help, and the ships clashed on the shores of Ayanusae. The ships rammed into each other, while the waves of Poseidon clashed and churned against the island's shores. The Athenians opened up their ships as they advanced, taking full control of the naval landscape, and with their rear covering any gaps to stop the Spartans from passing between and surrounding them. Despite the numerical advantage, it was not an easy victory for the Athenians, as both of our sources mention that the battle lasted for a very long time. Having made his choice, Callicratidas met his end on that fateful day, though our sources differ on how this happened. We know that he took his ship and rammed into the Athenians. According to Xenophon, he fell off the ship during the ramming and died, while Diodorus claims he got entangled with the ships of Pericles the Younger and fell while fighting. Whatever the case, Callicratidas died fighting his enemies for the glory of his alliance. It had been said that before the battle, his allies told him that it would be difficult for them to win, so they had to forestall the fight. He is thought to have replied like King Leonidas or Hector of the Trojans by saying, If I die in combat, Sparta will suffer no ill. If I surrender, Sparta will endure great shame. Eventually, one of the Spartan flanks also broke, signalling the beginning of the end, though both our main sources disagree on whether it was the right or left flank. The Peloponnesians fled to Chios, leaving the Athenians behind. Seventy ships of Sparta were destroyed, while only twenty-five ships were destroyed on the Athenian side. This was a fight won by a desperate Athenian state. It is here that we see what happened to Conon, who was still under blockade. 
The generals decided to split their army to go to Mytileni to help him escape the blockade he was in, with two-thirds going to help and one-third staying behind to save their comrades at sea. Two triarchs, Thrasivulos and Theramenes, were tasked with trying to save the remaining sailors, while the other Navarchs went to pursue the Spartans. Etionicus, the Peloponnesian commander at Mytileni, evacuated his army and his fleet, allowing Conon to emerge from the blockaded city and link up with the main Athenian fleet. Due to the split in naval forces and a massive storm which constrained the movements of ships, neither enough wounded were saved nor the dead collected. Thus, when news reached Athens, they were as bittersweet as the shade of Odysseus's mother when they met in the gates of Hades. The Athenians were angry. The generals knew this. As they watched the sunset at Ionusae, the Athenian debates would commence once more. The debate in the aftermath of the battle was very heated. The generals believed Theramenes to be at fault for not saving the drowned sailors, while Theramenes thought the generals had been too long in pursuing the Spartans. The former believed Theramenes was trash-talking them, a common sight in Athenian politics. As such, they sent a letter mentioning the blame was due to the storm. The Athenians were angry, so the generals thought Theramenes had begun his own campaign against them, due to people angrily blaming them for the deaths of the men. As such, they sent another letter discussing how the captains had been given the order to collect the dead, implicitly blaming them for the tragedy and letting themselves off the hook. Theramenes and Thrasyvulos were very influential in ancient Athens, as well as being efficient politicians and speakers. As such, they began to lobby in the Agora, claiming that they were given an impossible order to fulfill. Diodorus tells us that making these two as enemies doomed the generals. Arasinides was imprisoned, while two others, Aristogenes and Protomachos, felt that it would be a biased trial against them and had deserted before arriving. This made the situation for the remaining generals even more precarious, as a perception of guilt was sown among the Athenians. There was a heated debate, with many discussing the pros and cons of their guilt. The trial's emotional high stakes were harrowing, and thus the trial was hasty and without the usual recourse to the law that Athens was known for. As such, the six remaining generals and many of their inferior officers were found guilty and executed. Many Athenians later realized their erroneous procedures and the cruelty of the punishment they inflicted upon the generals and came to regret it. Sparta also offered peace on the status quo's terms, knowing full well that Lysander, who was very powerful and eager to regain command, and was both bold and without moral qualms, was bound to try to regain power. Athens ended up refusing, as many politicians, including a man called Cleophon, thought that they could win complete supremacy over the Aegean. This was when the three fates decided the fate of the war. Lysander was bound to return, and Sparta was still in an alliance with Persia. As such, the war was bound to continue. We are approaching the war's final two years, which will be decisive in their geopolitical effects upon Hellas. The two alliances will settle their scores on multiple fronts, on land and sea. In addition, the Athenians will finally have to face the Spartans on their soil and defend their homes, as they once did against the Persians. The clashes will be mighty, and the stakes will be high, and only the Olympians know who will go to Elysium and who to Tartarus. This series will continue with a video on the Battle of Egospotami and the Siege of Athens, so make sure you have subscribed and press the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.